Okay, hello everybody. My name is uh, Nicolas Prono. I'm a lecturer at the Center for Tourism Research in uh, Wakayama University. And today is my great pleasure to be uh, moderating a keynote session number two of uh, our conference. This conference uh, will touch upon the subject of the golden age of content tourism already or, or still to come by uh, Professor Philip Seaton. Professor uh, Philip Seaton, can you hear me? I can, yes. Welcome today to Thank you conference. very much. Thank yep. you very much for having you today here. Just before you, you start, I will just uh, briefly uh, introduce you to the, to the rest of the, our participants. Uh, Philip Seaton is professor and vice dean at the Institute of uh, Japan Studies, Tokyo University of Foreign Studies. He researches war memories in Japan and content tourism with a particular focus on historical dramas and film. His books on the topic of tourism include Content Tourism in Japan, Content Tourism and Pop Culture Fandom, and the upcoming book War as Entertainment and Content Tourism in Japan. Additionally, he also has a Japan content, Contested War Memories. Here I have the, the volume, I also read it myself. Uh, and he has also guest edit uh, special editions of uh, Japan Forum and Journal of War and uh, Culture Studies. Uh, before we start, just a small uh, reminder to our uh, participants. If you have uh, any questions or any comments about the, the presentation for uh, Professor Seaton, please uh, write them in the chat box or and then after uh, the, the presentation, we'll have uh, around 20 minutes of uh, Q&A. Okay, over to you, Professor. Great, thank you very much. Um, uh, it's a great honor to be here and thank you very much for your kind uh, invitation. Um, can I check everybody can hear me okay? Are we all good? <clears throat> okay. It's, uh, my talk today is uh, the golden age of content tourism already over or still to come. Um, the main idea behind my talk uh, is as follows. Um, we're just emerging from perhaps the greatest shock to the international system since 1945, namely the COVID pandemic. But since 2020, the global in, uh, the, since 2020, the global tourism industry has been absolutely uh, ravaged by the pandemic. My aim today is to think about how we move into the post-COVID or with COVID era from the perspective of content tourism. I'll explain how I envisage content tourism as part of the future of tourism as we reshape, rethink, reload, renew, regenerate, and restart our traveling. Um, however, waiting for us as we emerge from the pandemic is the climate crisis, which has been li largely sidelined as we tackle COVID-19. That problem is not going away with a vaccine. The latest Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report published on the 28th of February has repeated the familiar line um, that the looming disaster is driven by human activity and we're rapidly running out of time to do anything meaningful about it. The magnitude of the climate crisis makes the problems created by the pandemic seem relatively small scale. Given that the tourism industry is a major contributor to carbon emissions, the question uh, perhaps should not be how can we restart tourism, but instead to what extent is it right to restart tourism? And in this context, I'll be arguing that content tourism has much potential as a low carbon form of tourism fit for the age of climate breakdown. But then just as I was making progress on writing this talk, something else happened. On the 24th of February, Russia invaded Ukraine. I'm speaking here today in my capacity uh, as a tourism researcher, but uh, my DPhil and first three books were all on the topic of war memories and the so-called history issue uh, in Japan. My search has just come back full circle to war memories in my latest book co-authored with my longtime research partner, Yamamura Takayoshi uh, at Hokkaido University. And this month, our book, War as Entertainment and Contents Tourism in Japan is published. The theoretical framework of that book speaks directly to some of the directions that tourism might take uh, in Ukraine and Russia in the coming decades. So my talk today draws together aspects from all of my research over the past two decades in contents tourism uh, and war memories. But connecting it all together uh, is the climate crisis as the greatest existential threat to humanity. Let us begin, however, with a definition of content tourism. 
Content tourism is a Japanese term which was created using loan words from English, and it has now returned to English as technical jargon to describe a particular phenomenon. Our basic working definition comes from our 2017 book, Contents Tourism in Japan. It is travel behavior motivated fully or partially by narratives, characters, locations, and other creative elements of popular culture forms, including film, television dramas, manga, anime novels, and computer games. We still use this initial definition as it's relatively simple for newcomers to this area to grasp the concept, especially for people working in English who are familiar with terms like film-induced tourism or literary tourism. However, our more recent uh, and refined definition is as follows. It's a little long, but bear with me. Contents tourism is a dynamic series of tourism practices slash experiences motivated by contents defined above as information, such as narratives, characters, locations, and other creative elements, that has been produced and edited in popular culture forms and that brings enjoyment when it is consumed. Contents tourists access and embody narrative worlds that are evolving through contentsization, namely the continual process of the development and expansion of the narrative world through both mediatized adaptation and tourism practice. There are two things that we prefer about this uh, second definition. The first is the focus on narratives and narrative worlds as opposed to media platforms. To us, the power of narratives to induce travel rather than the means by which we access the narratives are the real focus of content tourism research. The second uh, is the way in which the role of tourism practice contributes to the evolution of narrative worlds. In other words, whereas there's always an original work or franchise that establishes the narrative world, the fans take an active role in developing that narrative world, including via their activities as tourists. Year zero for content tourism research in Japan uh, is 2005. This is when the Japanese government first talked about using uh, local contents and narratives as tourism resources and encouraged municipalities to use these resources for regional revitalization. Research then developed in a number of distinct trajectories. Masabuchi Toshiyuki and others in the Ac uh, Academy of Contents Tourism followed the spirit of the Japanese government policy and analyzed how contents tourism connected to regional revitalization. Another group of Japanese scholars, including Yamamura Takeyoshi and Okamoto Takeshi, considered tourism particularly as a form of manga and anime fan practice. Since Subiton, Yamamura Sensei and I published the first article in English defining content tourism in 2013, I, along with Yamamura Sensei and our research collaborators over the course of two JSPS grants, have tried to demonstrate the relevance of content tourism beyond anime, beyond manga, and beyond Japan uh, in a broad international context. The most recent focus of our research project has connected contents tourism to war-related travel. After all, war is a powerful creator of narratives, iconic historical figures, representations in popular culture, and sites of pilgrimage. So contents tourism research has undergone rapid growth and development over the last 17 years. And now let me get to that key phrase of my title golden age of contents tourism. What do I mean by that? Well, a key factor in our understanding of contents tourism is that the tourism is induced by works of popular culture that were not produced with the aim of inducing tourism. In principle, contents tourism is not the result of tourism marketing. Let's take the example of the anime Lucky Star which was one of the first major case studies of contents tourism. The opening sequence of this anime features a shrine tori that has become a sacred site for fans. This is a real place, Washimiya Shrine in what is now Kuki City. However, the producers of the anime did not create the scene with the intention of turning the shrine into a major tourist site. 
why would they? At the production stage of a new anime, they are mainly worried about whether their work will be a hit or not. Besides, how does an anime production company gain any commercial benefit from turning a public place into a tourist attraction? No, this site was used as part of a trend within anime production to use real places as locations as a way of enhancing the realism and detail of their work. In many cases, using real locations is also a cost-cutting measure. Converting digital photos into anime backdrops can save time and money in the production process. Heavily inspired by the catchy opening sequence, Lucky Star fans started visiting Washimia after the anime series was screened in 2007. It became one of the early case studies of content tourism research. Here was a town with little prior tourism that was suddenly visited by thousands of fans. It also spawned academic discussion of content tourism best practice. This was argued to be collaboration among the three main actors, fans, content producers, and the municipality, who are joined by their shared respect for the contents. For all the details, I encourage you to read Yamamura Sensei's 2015 article on Lucky Star in Japan Forum. However, as more people recognized that anime works were generating significant tourism or sacred site pilgrimage, to use the term used by Japanese fans, the more difficult it became for content producers to disregard potential tourism windfalls as part of the commercial strategy for their productions. Local authorities keen to attract more tourists became more proactive in trying to attract content producers to use their communities as both story settings and as filming locations. As content tourism policy and the Cool Japan strategy gathered momentum, it became increasingly difficult for works to exclude tourism considerations during the production process. However, it would be wrong to suggest that there was little understanding of content tourism's potential before 2005, when the phenomenon received its name by a recognition in government policy. Back in the 1960s, when NHK's Tiger Dramas first aired on Japanese television, the ability of television dramas to stimulate tourism was already clear. And while there was no comprehension of it at the time as content tourism, travelers such as the 17th century poet Matsuo Basho were clearly motivated to visit places appearing in other poems, stories, and historical narratives. Traveling a story, monogatari o tabesuru, to use Masabuchi Toshiyuki's resonant phrase, is a very old human practice indeed. By the 2010s, however, content producers often did little to hide their considerations of tourism. Two clear examples were in 2013, when both NHK's morning drama Amachan and the tiger drama Yae no Sakura had explicit aims of inducing tourism to help areas of Tohoku devastated by the 2011 earthquake and tsunami. While NHK's drama institutions could get away with such explicit tourism promotionalism on the grounds that it was trying to help disaster zones, unsubtle tourism advertising masquerading as a work of entertainment has often fallen flat. Ultimately, the work has to impress on an artistic level to create a narrative world that will attract a loyal fandom. Only then is the power of a work to induce content tourism fully realized. Fans of a genre know instinctively when they're being treated only as potential tourists, particularly by politicians and officials. As such, I've often thought of the period from 2005 to around 2015 as the golden era of content tourism. This was the period when there was enough knowledge about sacred site pilgrimage to give it an economic impact beyond just a handful of dedicated fans. But it was also a period when content production with an explicit purpose of promoting tourism was still relatively rare. All the time, however, the purest vision of content tourism was being eroded. The result 
was an increasing number of media articles like this one about Tenchi Miyo on the Anime News Network. I'll read a little bit from it. Representatives from the city of Takahashi in Okayama Prefecture announced on Monday that the city is raising money to fund a new Tenchi Muyo series. The tentatively titled I Tenchi Muyo will be set in Takahashi, as the city hopes fans will come on a pilgrimage to see the setting of the anime and plans to sell goods and host related events. In such cases, we're witnessing the erosion of the purest version of content tourism. And with it, in my view, we're also witnessing the breakdown of the collaborative model espoused by Yamamura Sensei in his article about Lucky Star, namely collaboration between content producers, fans, and local communities based on a common respect for the contents. To me, producing an anime simply as a vehicle to promote tourism does not feel like respect for the contents, but perhaps I'm a bit too much of an idealist. But anyway, this in a nutshell is the argument for the golden age of content tourism being already over. The purest vision of fans traveling to sites made special by their connections to a narrative world has been replaced by a more functionalist reality whereby content producers and municipalities work on the assumption that fans will travel to places suggested by tourism promoters masquerading as content producers. Let us now focus on the period of climate breakdown in which I think content tourism will assume growing prominence as we move beyond the era of COVID-19 travel restrictions. One of the key words in tourism studies at the moment is regenerative. There's no fixed definition of regenerative tourism, but let me just come straight out and say that I'm a bit of a regenerative tourism skeptic. To me, the term implies that tourism somehow leaves a place or the planet as a whole in a better environmental shape than before the tourism. Maybe this can be achieved through cordoning off large areas of land in nature reserves or via the transference of tourist sites to communities who truly care about their environment. And by taking such resources away from corporations intent on simply extracting those resources for economic profit. But the reality is, as soon as tourists become involved, there is inevitably an environmental impact somewhere. When I hear the term regenerative, what really comes to my mind is the phrase used by environmentalists such as the British journalist George Monbiot, rewilding. It's easy to see why this word, this word fits uncomfortably in tourism studies. The assumption behind rewilding is that we create places where humans simply do not go. Regeneration in this context means human non-intervention so that nature has a chance to heal. In a sense, tourism is the antithesis of rewilding. Writing in 2020 in the journal Tourism Geographies, Jenny Cave and Diane Dredge give a good overview of some of the alternative economic models that have been proposed in the past few decades to make tourism more sustainable and even regenerative. But tourism researchers concerned about the environment understandably have problems talking about the elephant in the room. Tourism is the problem and the environmentally friendly thing is often not to do it. Only in extremely rare circumstances, I think, can tourism genuinely be called regenerative. No, instead, we must accept that there is a certain minimum level of carbon emissions and destructiveness that we incur, first of all, just by being alive and then by being tourists. The challenge for humanity is to minimize environmentally destructive consumption over and above that minimum level of inevitable destructiveness required for survival. This idea of meeting our minimum needs of, to survive while not overshooting into environmentally destructive practices is the, es is the essence of Kate Rayworth's concept of donut economics. In Rayworth's iconic model, human activity must take place in the safe space between the minimum threshold that allows us to meet the basic needs of human survival 
and the maximum boundary, the ecological ceiling, beyond which humanity and its activities must not go uh, if we are to remain sustainable. What I like about Rayworth's model is the practical lesson it tells us about our conduct as individuals. It seeks a balance between our individual human rights to survival, but also our common human obligations to others and to the planet. I guess my real concern is this, the term regenerative tourism can easily be co-opted by the unscrupulous to trick people into thinking that tourism per se helps the environment. And so in order to help the environment, we should, doing, we should be doing more and more of it. There are other such smoke and mirrors tricks used by the travel industry. The classic one is carbon offsetting when flying. We pay a little extra and feel okay that our carbon footprint has been offset somehow by somebody somewhere planting a few trees. Actually, the environmentally sound practice was not to take the flight in the first place. Indeed, it's even better to plant the trees without having taken the flight. So much of this environmental sounding language, particularly carbon offsetting, is greenwashing. It masks the real agenda of maintaining tourism as a growth industry. The answer really should be degrowth or non-consumption of tourism. Until that is, we drop below the level of economic activity required to allow people to meet their survival needs. Ultimately, this is why I prefer the term sustainable tourism. It reminds us that tourism, however much we all love doing it, has a destructive element that needs to be minimized. While academics love talking about noble case studies of alternative, ethical, or regenerative tourism, the reality is that the vast majority of tourism policy and practice tends to follow the destructive consumerist growth model. Just look at Japan's relentless increase in targets for inbound tourists during the early 2000s, when inbound tourism rose from 5.2 million people in 2003 to 31.8 million people in 2019. The COVID-19 pandemic sent that bonanza crashing down. But when national policy is exponential growth, actually, what chance is there really of regenerative tourism practices being any more than a worthy exception to business as usual? It's also helpful to think of regenerative tourism and sustainable tourism in their negative formulations. It's much better, in my view, to call out bad practice by calling it unsustainable than unregenerative, which is a bit of a vague mouthful to say. So I consider regeneration to be a utopian principle applicable in some cases, but sustainability is the key issue that every tourist and tourism operator needs to be addressing now. After this long discussion of environmental issues, it's time to bring contents tourism back into the picture. In a nutshell, I believe that contents tourism has the potential to be a relatively sustainable form of tourism with a relatively low environmental footprint suitable for the age of climate breakdown in the 21st century. This is despite the fact that so much of the early Japanese government rhetoric surrounding contents tourism starting back in 2005 is about revitalization, not regeneration. Early government policy in Japan was about returning economic vitality to aging, depopulating and stagnating local communities via the use of narratives and contents as tourist resources. In other words, the focus, as in national inbound tourism policy, was commercial growth. Environmental protection was in there only as far as the conservation of sites, stories and tourism resources was a precondition for their utilization as a commercial tourism resource. Nevertheless, I think that contents tourism does have the ability to become a relatively sustainable form of tourism. Let me start this argument by going back to one of the earliest cases of contents tourism, the Japanese haiku poet Matsuo Basho. 
Basho has featured quite prominently in contents tourism research. Masabuchi Toshiyuki discussed him in, the 2020, in his 2010 book, What is Contents Tourism? And he has featured as a case study in all three of our books on contents tourism so far. Basho is interesting both because he was a contents tourist and because he continues to inspire contents tourism today. As a contents tourist, he traveled to places made famous by other poems, and he also visited places associated with historical battles, popular, popularized in gunkimono, or epic military tales. The poems that he wrote while at these places have themselves become tourism resources. His poems are put on monuments at the sites that Basho visited, and form part of the modern day tourism trail in many parts of Japan. In terms of all the, the, the discussion of environmental issues that I've made, Basho is also interesting as the perfect model of carbon neutral contents tourism. He walked on his long journeys around Japan and took with him only the minimal number of possessions. The places he visited were not tourist sites in the sense that they had undergone a commercial touristification process. His carbon emissions were essentially what they would have been if he had stayed at home. This must be the aspiration for tourism in the 21st century. Our environmental footprint as tourists is no greater than what our environmental footprint would have been if we had just stayed at home. And this last point is key. To understand the implications further, it's helpful to think of the environmental impact of tourism in terms of fixed costs and variable costs. The fixed costs are the environmental costs of creating a tourism destination. This means the construction of hotels and attractions, cutting down trees for access roads and creation of other such infrastructure. Laying concrete is one of the most carbon intensive and environmentally destructive practices that humans have devised. Every tourist site with extensive concrete has already had a massive carbon footprint even before the first tourist arrives. Then there are the variable costs. These are environmental impacts associated with each individual visit. They include transportation to the site, the laundering of bed sheets and towels after just one night in a hotel, and the consumption of souvenirs. One of the keys to the environmental sustainability of contents tourism is that it often entails very few fixed environmental costs. Many sacred site pilgrimages by fans of a pop culture work are day trips to places that are otherwise unremarkable as tourist destinations. The shrine in Washimir is a good case in point. There was no need for hotels, car parks, and other site development. The fans wanted to see the shrine as it appeared in the opening sequence of the anime. If they could get to the site on public transport, their contents tourism was approaching the Matsuo Basho ideal of no environmental footprint over and above the inevitable environmental footprint that comes from just being alive for a day. This fundamentally is how contents tourism can be highly sustainable. It has little to no fixed environmental costs and negligible variable environmental costs, but it still results in a meaningful tourism experience. This is sustainability in practice. However, let me take off my rose tinted spectacles for a moment and inject a little more realism. Those fans visiting Washimir were also looking for souvenirs and mementos. Indeed, fans are known to be highly active consumers of merchandise. There are clear environmental impacts here by consumerist behavior linked to content tourism. There are also plenty of examples of fixed environmental costs associated with content tourism, such as the construction of Disneyland and literary museums. However, as a general principle, in content tourism, the thing that gives value to a site is its narrative quality. The site does not have to be particularly beautiful, convenient, or developed. It has to be meaningful. And there is little environmental footprint associated with meaningfulness. As such, there can be tourism without many of the environmental impacts of touristification. Contents tourism is also a way of encouraging us to stay local in our tourism. We often overlook 
the tourist attractions closest to our homes, because it only feels like tourism if we've gone a long distance. Things closer to home feel restricted, or perhaps like leisure rather than tourism. But during the COVID-19 pandemic, we have had to get used to geographical restrictions on our mobility. One way to enhance the enjoyment of localized tourism is to enhance its meaningfulness via stories. In other words, doing local contents tourism. Let me explain what I mean via a simple local example. This is a map showing a radius of about five kilometers from my office at Tokyo University of Foreign Studies. This is the range I can get to on my bike within half an hour. Here are a few of the sets of contents that I can access. Shinsengumi. Kondo Isami, the leader of Shinsengumi, was born just a stone's throw from campus. There are numerous dramas, anime, novels, and novels associated with this group of Tokugawa loyalists active in the 1860s. It's also only a short train ride from campus to Hino, where there are many other Shinsengumi sites. Mizuki Shigeru. The famous manga artist and creator of Kitaro lived close to Jindaiji Temple, where there is the Kitaro Tea House selling all sorts of Mizuki memorabilia. There are also various objects and statues of Mizuki's characters dotted around Chopu City, particularly in Tenjin Dori shopping street. Chofu. Tufts is in Fuchu City, but right on the border with Chofu City. Chofu brands itself as the city of film because of the major studios that have operations in the city, including Kadokawa and Nikatsu. Tama Cemetery. This is just a stone's throw to the east of campus. Literary fans wanting to visit the graves of uh, Mishima Yukio, Oka Shohei, Yosuno Akiko, and Erogawa Rampo can pay a visit. There are also many military figures buried here, such as Admiral Yamamoto Isoroku, who has appeared as a character in countless war films. These are just four obvious examples of sites of contents tourism within easy cycling distance of campus. Indeed, we could even call Tufts campus a sacred site because it has been used as a filming location for various dramas, including Shitsuren Chocolatier and Ivo series 13 and 18. At this point, I want to reiterate the most recent definition of contents tourism we use, and particularly this part. Contents tourists access and embody narrative worlds that are evolving through contentsization, namely the continual process of the development and expansion of the narrative world through both mediatized adaptation and tourism practice. Notice how we've positioned tourism practice as a means by which the narrative world is expanded. In other words, Shinsen, Shinsengumi fans, for example, are contributing to the Shinsengumi world via their travel. There's no better indication of this than the people who travel from afar to take part in the Shinsengumi festival in Hino City each May. These tourists take part in a parade, thereby becoming part of the tourist attraction itself. And they also contribute to the growing legend surrounding Shinsengumi via their blogs, social media posts, and cosplay performances. It is this dynamic interaction between tourists, fans, and narrative worlds that our research group considers to be such an important characteristic of contents tourism. The result is that contents tourism does not necessarily have to take you long distances to be meaningful. Furthermore, localized contents tourism facilitates a cycle of tourism and mediatized consumption. You visit a local site, and realize its connections to contents. For example, on a trip to Jindaiji, you learn that there was a connection to someone called Mizuki Shigeru. You seek out the contents to understand why this local site exists, for example, by reading some of his manga. And then you return to the same site with a deeper understanding and to learn more. Contents tourism as a means of engaging with local community has much potential. This was obvious during the pandemic when we could not travel far. This will become increasingly necessary in the era of climate breakdown as we try to scratch our travel itches with the minimum possible environmental footprint. 
And finally, I want to address briefly at the end of my talk, the unfolding tragedy in Ukraine. Obviously the situation is changing every day and we have no idea where the war will take Russia, Ukraine and the planet as a whole. But we're witnessing an epoch defining moment in real time. The war seems to have ended the COVID-19 era, at least in terms of COVID as the dominant media story of our time. Of course, infection numbers remain high and the COVID-19 crisis has not gone away, but it no longer dominates the headlines and public discourse. In many ways, the pandemic has been a psychological event as much as a public health event. The Ukraine war has fundamentally reset the psychological and societal context in which we plan and carry out tourism. As such, the war affects deeply the original planned emphasis for my talk today, namely the role of content tourism as we transition from focusing on COVID-19 to focusing on the climate crisis. In the talk thus far, I've stuck to that topic, but now I will just add a little postscript about how war in Ukraine affects that assessment and also my thinking about content tourism. I have felt the need to do this in particular um, because for the last three years, these connections between war and content tourism have been at the center of my research. So as I mentioned, um, we've got a book coming out very soon. And the main premise of the book is that however horrifying and destructive a war is in real time, it will ultimately generate many works of popular culture entertainment, significant levels of tourism, and at the intersection of these two, content tourism. We know from the examples of Hiroshima and Nagasaki that even nuclear devastation ultimately leads to cultural production, the construction of memorial sites, and in time, a tourism industry. Analyzing how this happens is the task we set ourselves for the book. It's deeply disturbing that some of the theory we developed is going to be tested in real life as soon as the book comes out. Let me just introduce one part of the model from the book. We hypothesize that war-related tourism emerges in four phases. The first is tourism during war. The numbers may be small, but some people travel to war zones to witness it for themselves. Then, in the immediate aftermath of war, some people travel to sites of recent conflict before there has been any touristification process. The third stage is in the post-war era when memorials, monuments, museums, and other such sites are developed as part of both commemoration and touristification processes. And the fourth stage is when the war is sufficiently far into the past or the society has come to terms sufficiently with its war history. At this point, the war can be treated within works of entertainment and tourism is for leisure rather than having a deeper commemorative meaning. But note in the model how this process occurs at radically different speeds according to the nature of the war. In some circumstances, entertainmentization and touristification can proceed rapidly. In other circumstances, it will take a great deal of time. How Ukraine and Russia fit into this theory has yet to, have yet to be seen. Indeed, the current conflict might cause us to radically rethink parts of this model, which has been created in a, largely in the East Asian context. Only time will tell. However, what we can say with certainty is the following. Propaganda and national myth-making have existed for as long as there have been wars between nations. But what our research highlights is their connection to future cultural production and tourism. We can already identify some of the key characters, locations and themes that will appear in future cultural productions and probably content tourism. And we can already identify sites of memory that will in time transition to tourist sites. Russia is on a course to have deeply divided memories of this war. We can already see the conflict within Russian attitudes toward the, towards the war. Many Russians are bravely expressing their opposition, even under threat of arrest, imprisonment, or worse. For Ukrainians, this is a defining moment of nationhood. And as long as there are, 
as long as there are Ukrainians, this moment will be engraved in their national history. Warfare also links to the environmental issues that I've discussed. There's nothing more destructive to the environment than warfare. It feels futile almost to be worrying about the carbon footprint of a new hotel when we're watching on the evening news whole towns being laid waste by indiscriminate shelling. Those towns will have to be all rebuilt. And do our air miles really matter given the tank, fighter and cruise missile miles that are being accumulated in Europe at the moment? or the plumes of smoke from boiling, uh, burning oil refineries. War is always an ecological catastrophe with countless trees and animals killed alongside humans and a massive spike in carbon emissions that can only exacerbate the climate crisis. So it's been a varied wood, uh, talk with discussion ranging from Matsuo Basho to the war in Ukraine. But to finish, let me answer briefly once again the main question in my title. The golden age of contents tourism, already over or still to come? The contents tourism purist in me laments the passing of an era in Japan during which people could enjoy an anime, manga or drama without worrying if they were simply being advertised to as a potential contents tourist. The environmentally minded optimist in me has made the case for why contents tourism has an important role in the coming years as we try to balance our love of tourism with the collective obligation to protect our planet. The war memory specialist in me sees the horrors of war in Ukraine as not only a terrible human tragedy whose scars will remain for generations, but also as a crucible for the creation of the most powerful forms of narrative world, a heroic national struggle for survival. One thing joins all of them together, telling stories is fundamental to who we are as a species. Traveling those stories has centuries of history and should have centuries more of time in the future. But to ensure that traveling stories actually has a future, peace and decisive action to prevent climate breakdown are urgent priorities for us today. Thank you very much. Professor Sitton, thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. Have been very interesting to hear all the different uh, relationships between contents tourism, degrowth, environmental issues, war, and you can see it has touched many uh, contemporary issues, uh, you know, around the world, in Japan, in, in Ukraine, around the world. Uh, we have now around uh, 15 minutes for a question for the public. So if you have any questions, please uh, put them here in the chat box. So, I can uh, read them. While the, the, while the public is uh, writing the question, I wanted to ask you the, if you see any influence of a technological advances, for example, lately there have been many news about VR and AR technologies uh, in the production and consumption of uh, content tourism. Yeah, I mean, this, uh, there are so many um, ways in which technology has brought on contents tourism. Um, we can almost, you know, count them each year. Um, so when social media first came along, that radically changed the way that um, uh, contents tourists were behaving, you know, the, the ability to, um, to upload their, their pictures, their selfies in real time. And then we started having apps uh, which allowed you to take photos with your you know, favorite character mm -hmm. once you're in a, a particular place. And now we're getting you know, into the, the type of virtual tours that um, we've heard in, in previous talks today. So you know, it, almost every year there is some new piece of technology that comes along and, and adds a bit more to this. Um, uh, and also, it's not just the technology, it's the, the societal norms that go along with the use of that technology. So for example, when things like TikTok come along and you've, you've got these extremely short videos, people are interested, not so much in the contents that you know, they've consumed, that they're, they're mm -hmm. thinking about the type of short video that they can upload to their own social media account. Um, and uh, an interesting sort of new development within contents tourism studies is the idea of meme tourism. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is where 
you know, you, you're not focusing on the consumption of, of the narrative world and what it means to you as a fan. You're thinking about how you can uh, transmit something via your social media to all of your friends and followers that, that will link back to something that they know about. So you know, as the technology develops, it's also developing the, the behaviors and the practices that tourists are, uh, are performing as well. There is a very big, uh, like I say, a very big relationship uh, mm -hmm. here. Yeah. So I wanted to actually, if you see any, ah, here I have a question from uh, Joseph who says, uh, has Japan developed a unique approach to content tourism that is beyond reproduction elsewhere? And does, it this, and does this have its origins in the post-World War II environment where soft power and the desire to rejoin the global community was undertaken in earnest? Mm. Okay, um, thanks Joseph. Uh, unique is a word that I always hesitate to use uh, in the context uh, of Japan. Uh, and the, what we've tried to do in contents tourism research um, is to develop the theory looking at Japanese uh, examples and then to refine that theory and see how it applies um, to, to other countries. So you know, on a cultural level, yes, we can see certain things which um, are Japan specific, but once we're looking at the, you know, the, the underlying theory, the, the broader practices, we see a large amount of, of sort of transnational commonality. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, what, we've, what I've tried to do, and this is where I've got my Japanese studies person uh, uh, hat on, um, is not to try and you know, box off Japan as, as some kind of unique case study, the lessons of which don't apply elsewhere. We've tried to say, this is what we've learned from Japan and, and now the rest of the world can see if what we've come up with is, is useful. Um, so uh, I've, we've worked quite hard to develop theory based on Japanese case studies, but ultimately to make it internationally usable and internationally relevant. Thank you very much. Yes, like you said, I think it's very important to have this, uh, to try to relate what we make us, you know, the research about Japan also to relate it to other countries because sometimes we have this very like mm. Japan unique uh, yeah. view and yeah. I have another question uh, here. Uh, says, I'm curious about, uh, about how context tourism deals with character narrative design specifically for sale of character mm -hmm. merchandise that can be seen, for example, in Sanrio. For example, as you, note, any, as you noted, anime uh, development often has storylines, even if they are designed to entice visitations. In comparison, Sanrio characters Kudetama uh, appears in a long running series of very short videos and which has recently included visits to all prefectures in Japan. In this case, physical consumption, as opposed to narrative or entertainment, is the starting point. Mm. This, this taps into an extremely important issue that we've, we've discussed quite a lot within the research group. Um, so uh, characters are ubiquitous across Japan. A lot of the time they're being um, you know, created by local authorities um, for the purpose of tourism promotion, you know, Kumamon and, and in Kumamoto is, is the most famous one, but pretty much every um, prefecture and, and town seems to have one these days. Um, or many. Um, yeah. And uh, we, we've tended to avoid looking at those um, promotional characters unless they have somehow um, taken on, you know, the, the narrative element of, of content. In other words, um, if, they've, if they have, let's say, got their own anime series or they've somehow been incorporated into storytelling or they've got some very strong link to you know, local, uh, local history, then we'll look at them. But if it's just you know, some kind of cute character that is designed to sell some sushi, we're not looking uh, at them as, as examples of contents tourism. Um, there's also within contents tourism um, studies, this kind of division between um, the selling of, of the narrative and the, uh, the selling of the, of the character goods. So if you go to any um, uh, uh, omiyage shop, any souvenir shop, you know, in a, in a, uh, a train station or, a, or an airport or wherever, you'll very often see the local characters um, being sold and people just pick them up as a local souvenir, but because they're not 
they're not channeling into any um, any story. Um, we we tend to ignore those those examples. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, like you said, there are, oh, there are many uh, of these characters that represent, you know, different mm. prefectures, even cities. And I think that also sometimes the Japanese make a bit of mm. fun of them. Yeah. Because there are, there are a lot, a lot of them. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And let's see if we have any other comments or a question for the public. I wanted to ask you if you see any effect of the COVID-19 travel restrictions or even any future degrowth of tourism on inbound visitors that visit, you know, uh, content the, uh, tourism destinations abroad. For example, you know, many of the inbound tourists come to Japan well to consume mm. uh, anime, manga, etc. Cetera, et cetera. You see, maybe there are going to be some kind of uh, change here. They will consume it differently, maybe. Um, well, I mean, first of all, we need to get over the. Um, the, the current travel restrictions. Um, because I, I work in a um, department that has lots of international students, at the moment we're wrestling with this problem of how to get them all into the country as soon as possible. I mean, I, I think inbound tourism isn't going to start up in any kind of real sense until 2023, because there's such a big backlog of, of people who want to be resident in Japan who, who are still waiting to, to get in. Mm. Um, um, I, you know, I think, uh, I think uh, Japan will try and get back to some of the, you know, the pre-COVID um, inbound practices. But what we've also seen during the COVID period is such devastation to a lot of the tourism infrastructure. You know, so many of those hotels that were mm. um, encouraged to open because the numbers um, were shooting up during, particularly during the 2010s. Mm. Um, the, those hotels have now hit the wall and they've shut down again. You don't just immediately open up that kind of tourism capacity again. Mm. So how Japan is going to convince people, you know, within the tourism industry in Japan to invest again in the sector, given that the next pandemic might just be around the corner. That's the really difficult ask. And I don't think we're going to get back to 31.8 million inbound visitors to Japan again. I think that's the highest we, we're going to get to for a very, very long time. Um, certainly a decade away, you know, to get back to those numbers. I may be completely wrong, but that's just my sense of the way it's, it's, it's going. Thank you very much. Uh, ah, here, Bailey on this says, uh, thank you very much. I was asking if there is a character development in the case of Sanrio characters, but not always narrative basis, uh, excluding Low Kitty. Mm, I, I can't say I've looked into Sanrio a lot. I've been to the uh, the Hello Kitty uh, or the Sanrio Puro Land um, uh, attraction in, in uh, Tama Center. Um, which is not that far from campus. It's another one of the places I could have mentioned as being within um, easy striking distance. I mean, what they have there is, is you know, lots, lots of cute characters, you know, wandering around and shaking hands of the visitors. And they also have song and dance performances on stage. There, there could be um, a, a, a content tourism uh, element uh, to it. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, Hello Kitty ultimately is character business, and it's you know how many handkerchiefs and and cute whatever can you sell with this you know Hello Kitty design on it. Yeah, they have a lot of merchandise with that. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. That helps to play them to say. Okay, mm. thank you very much. I know uh, we have still uh, around five minutes. If we have some short uh, questions or any comments uh, from the public. Myself, do you see any role of content tourism in grassroots uh, initiatives? Like you have been talking, you know, how sometimes even the the local government or the national mm -hmm. government wants to promote this from a top-down approach. Do you see sometimes the the community engaging in trying to do something about content tourism? Yeah, we do get um, those. Uh, um, examples quite a lot. I mean, local uh, film commissions, local authorities are always um, lobbying content producers to try and get the next anime or the next drama produced in their, their town. And 
another good example of this is the Tiger Drama. Uh, mm -hmm. So a lot of prefectures and cities um, you know, regularly request NHK to set the next Tiger Drama in, uh, in their town. Um, but what we see is a, a, you know, the hits and the misses sort of um, balancing out each other. We don't hear a lot about the misses because people tend to um, quietly sweep them under the carpet. Um, actually, one of the, the hits that um, uh, I think there has been was hinted at in one of the slides that I had, although you, you'd have to be very um, quick to have picked up on it. Nanto City in, in Toyama Prefecture um, has uh, PA Works, a, a famous anime company based in the city. And PA Works and the local government have worked together very successfully um, in local branding and, and local, local tourism um, products. And, and also PA Works has become quite a draw for um, anime fans wanting to, to visit Nantal. But the secret there was that the company had very strong roots um, within uh, the, the local community. And, you know, uh, if the, the anime company is, let's say, based in Tokyo, and then it just sort of decides to go out and co-opt the, um, the traditions, the landscapes of somewhere that they've got no other connection to, it, it's much more risk-laden, you know, that kind of, of collaboration. Um, and, and also, you know, is the only value coming out of this um, the tourism value, the, you know, the, the, the tourists who are going to come and spend yen in, in that locality? How do the local people feel about it? Um, you've got to have the, you know, the, the local community, you know, supportive, on board, wanting their community represented in this kind of way through this kind of, of work. And that doesn't always happen. Yeah? Some, some communities are very unhappy with the way that they're um, presented in, you know, manga, anime or whatever. Yeah, I read some, uh, a few papers that actually they had some kind of conflict when the fans yep. arrived. Yeah. I'm always yep. happy. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, just one final que question again from Joseph. To what extent are a kawaii narratives central to the nurturing of content tourism in Japan, or is perhaps a nuanced Japanese thing? Well, of, of course, kawaii is, is a big part of it. Um, but the, the assumption within kawaii is that the central character is a female character, and she's got a lot of the moe characteristics, the big, the big eyes, the um you know the you know the, the sort of the pouting look all of those you know sort of uh, classic images of of female characters shoujo characters within within anime but what we also find is that a lot of the uh, really successful examples of content tourism are female fans traveling male characters mm -hmm. and there's a lot of this within you know historical narratives So I'm thinking of things like the game, like Sengoku Basara, which which um, um, uh, which idealizes and and turns into ikemen, the the, the hunks or the the heartthrobs, um, you know, samurai from the the Warring States period, um, uh, and you know, Shin Sengumi is is another example that I mentioned in my talk. You now Hijikata Toshizo has been turned into almost a you know a pop star idol um, by his reputation within pop culture. So kawaii is in there, but it's only half the story. The other half of the story is ikemen, and then there are all sorts of other elements as well. So for example, J horror, you know, it has its its uh, its fans and it has its fan base. So people are coming, you know, for the, you know, the, the deeply disturbing um, um, horror films that coming, what's his name, Takashi Miike. I, I, I'm no horror fan, so I can't go anywhere near those um, films. But, you know, those kinds of productions have their fan base as well. Um, so it, it, there are lots of different, you know, keywords. Kawaii is one of them. Thank you very much. And like you say, I remember uh, there was a Reikijo phenomenon mm -hmm. also related. And I, re and I feel that even last week I went to Namba Station in Osaka and I saw a big billboard yep. for, I don't remember what it was, it was Sengoku Wasaru or something, but again, all Ikemen anime characters advertised yep. for uh, female, female mm -hmm. fans. And I've been working with uh, Akiko Sugawa Shimada, who, who, who writes about Reikijo in English almost as long as I've been working with Yamamura mm -hmm. Sensei. So we've We've got a very long research association there. I see. Mm -hmm. Okay, we are uh, reaching uh, at the end of the keynote session. I have been, uh, Professor Sitton, it has been a pleasure and honor to have you here with us. 
Uh, I don't know if you have any final remarks uh, before we finish. Thank you for having me. And uh, um, I hope everyone's enjoyed the talk and, and uh, the session and uh, take care. Thank you very much. And well, thank you everybody for uh, coming to our keynote uh, session number two. And uh, well, thank you very much. Thank you again, Professor Sito for uh, coming. Well, have a, have a good night. <laughs> thank you very much. We're finally uh, reaching the end of the day and we have some closing remarks now. Thank you very much. <laughs>